Thank you so much and good afternoon. So who here is familiar with, with dance? Great. So speaking to a very educated populace here. So I love this quote because I feel that it embodies the whole reason that we're here. And so this is a quote from Martha Graham, and that's the instrument through which the dance speaks is also the instrument through which life is lived, and that's the human body. Now, there are many different styles of dance, and nowadays I feel like young dancers are involved in, in what I call multi, multidisciplinary forms of movement. Ballet, however, is considered the foundation of all other techniques. So that's really what we're going to focus on in this short 30-minute session on preventing dance injuries is, is ballet. Now, dance offers a lot of different benefits to the, to the young individual. So things like discipline, and, and those little young dancers there definitely need a little discipline. Uh, Self-confidence, concentration, motivation, and, and then there's the physical attributes, so things like strength, flexibility, and coordination. Now, today's purpose is all about injury prevention. We're, we're going to talk a lot about how dance leads to injury, but I also want to talk about how dance might prevent injury. And so there was a study done out of New York that looked at the incidence of ACL injuries among elite ballet and modern dancers. And what we have found is that ballet dancers tend to have much lower rates of ACL injuries compared to their other active counterparts, soccer players, basketball players, football players. So you might scratch your head and say, well, well why? If you've ever had the honor and pleasure of going to a professional ballet performance, these guys are doing some pretty incredible things, literally flying through the air and then landing and not tearing their ACL. But based on earlier lectures from today, what we know is that jump and balance training has been shown to reduce ACL injury rates among athletes. And what do dancers do and what do they do best? Well, they focus on things like lower extremity alignment, jump, balance, and obviously they're in a controlled environment as well. And some football players definitely have taken to taking dance class as a regular part of their injury prevention. So maybe we should actually offer a ballet class to our other athletes. All right, so the education of the young dancer starts around age 8 or 10 years old. And they can start to ramp things up by the age of 12 and start taking up to four to six classes per week. And this typically coincides with a, with a, time, of, with, with, with a time of significant physiologic change. So it happens around pre-puberty pre, pre or puberty. Now I'm going to take you through some basic dance maneuvers, and if we weren't in such a kind of tight-knit space, I'd have you all stand and make an attempt at these, but Ruth was supposed to come up here and, and show some of them. All right, Professor Ruth Solomon. <laughs> all right, so, so, so in ballet, you can either be flat or up on demi point, so standing up on the ball of your feet. And then obviously you go on and ex execute these very complicated and beautiful maneuvers. If you're a woman, and women only unless you're in ballet trocadero, you can also dance on point or literally on the points of your toes. And you, Ruth, won't do that right now, hopefully. <laughs> but you're essentially placing all of your weight on the first and second toes. Then there is turnout. So the purpose of turnout is to be able to execute these complicated maneuvers while always facing the audience. So you're not turning necessarily to the side or to the back. Now, all dancers tend to want to achieve 180 degrees of turnout, Ruth. No. But <laughs> nobody has 180 degrees of turnout. Also, some young dancers might be told, hey, if you see a little femoral anaversion or maybe a lot of femoral anaversion, maybe you should go take ballet. Maybe not such a good idea. Then there's plie. These are all basic terms. If somebody comes to you, you should understand and maybe even have them execute. That's plie. And then a grand plie. I, didn't, I wasn't going to make you do grand plie, but you were doing grand plie. And then there's passe. All right. And then there's correct and incorrect technique. So dance is an art. It's not a science. And that art can lead to injury. However, incorrect technique just increases your risk for injury as well. Now, in order to understand injury prevention, you have to understand the definition of the injury, right? Dancers tend not to report pain as an injury, and there tends to be this huge discrepancy 
in terms of number of injuries versus report of pain. So we use this definition, which is pain or physical dysfunction that results in misparticipation, class, rehearsal, or performance. So when do we tend to see injuries? Well, dancers at greatest risk when returning after a period of relative inactivity, so start of a season, if, this, if there's been some sort of change in the frequency, intensity, duration, or even style of dance, if they're fatigued so they have decreased neuromuscular control, and there tends to be a 90% lifetime incidence, but I think this is higher, again, because dancers don't necessarily correlate pain with injury. They predominantly involve the lower extremity, and that makes sense, although men do do partnering, so lifting their partners up, which puts tremendous strain on the spine. And the majority are also overuse, so strains, sprains, and tendonitis, although obviously traumatic injuries can occur as well. And this is, this is what Dr. McKaylee has taught us. We tend to segregate these into to two different columns. Those are those that are intrinsic or within the dancer or extrinsic, so outside of the dancer, some of which are modifiable, some of which are not. So things like growth, flexibility, alignment, thinking about that femoral anaversion, muscle tendon imbalances, so holding yourself in turnout, doing repetitive uh, plies, et cetera, can certainly lead to imbalances in terms of pelvic uh, musculature, et cetera. Nutrition, psychological stress, technique and footwear. So I'm going to hand this over now to Dr. Stracolini, who's going to talk about the growth factor. Hi, good afternoon. Um, I've been uh, charged with talking about growth and how uh, it relates to injuring the young dancer. And I've been charged to do this in five minutes. And anybody that knows me knows I can't do anything in five minutes. Uh, I'm Italian, right? So it's going to be tricky, but let's see. So, um, <laughs> So the uh, adolescent growth spurt spans over a long period of time. It can be anywhere from 12 to 36 months. And interestingly enough, this is often met at a time when there's a coincident increase in the intensity and um, hours of dance per week. So it's the perfect storm, if you will, for the injury for the young dancer. Uh, we see a rapid increase in height, and as Dr. Meyer and others have pointed out today, it's not necessarily met with an increase in strength in neuromuscular control. We may see a decrease in strength, coordination and flexibility, decrease in technical skill, control and balance, and as you all know, these factors are critical in dance, right? So again, that perfect storm for injury. So the, the bone lengthens rapidly, and what happens? the muscle tendon unit lags behind. So we talk a lot about when we see the dancer in our clinic, not that they're weak, not that they're tight. I tend, I tend to stay away from these terms. I talk about imbalances, right? So as you know, that young dancer spends a lot of time in that externally rotated lower extremity position. The tight abductors of the hip become, the TFL become contracted and tight. They have the relatively weak adductors, so we talk a lot in, about imbalances. We stay away from the terms tight, we stay away from the terms weak, because as you know, dancers are strong, but they just develop imbalances as, as they go through growth, and this sets them up for injury. So what do we do? We talk about prevention, right, so strengthening. And I think it's important to talk about prevention efforts as it applies to the discipline of dance, right? So. These dancers, they develop these inherent muscle strength and balances. They have these dominant and contracted external rotators over their tight, relatively weaker internal rotators. So what do we do? We, we like to strengthen these dancers in parallel. So we focus on imbalances, right? So strengthening with regard to imbalances in dance. We like to strengthen them through full ranges of motion and in both directions. This is a picture of suspension training that we put in the Walnut Hill School for the Performing Arts. This was an innovative uh, thing to do. So the strength training is occurring in the dance studio. It's kinetic chain. It's through full range of motion, and the dancers love it. We talk about alignment and movement, right? So uh, Professor Solomon is going to talk about this with regard to training. I'm going to talk about this with regard to growth, so these young dancers grow. And our quest here is really for neutral alignment, right, that neutral pelvis. Look at the dancer from the side. They want to maintain neutral, right? So as the dancer grows, what happens? That overused, contracted, tight psoas, the tight quadriceps, the relatively weak posterior chain, the overstretched hamstrings, so they become that pelvis rotates forward, right? So now, what happens from the clinical side? What do we see in the young growing dancer? 
Low back pain, what do we think about? Stress injury to the posterior column or the spine, the spondylolysis, right? So we see that a lot in our extension-based performing arts young um, children, right? So the dancers, the gymnasts, right? So it's as they go through growth. So what is the, the, the quintessential overuse injury of the, of the young dancer or the young athlete, right? So this vulnerable growth cartilage. So the skeleton through growth is vulnerable. There's areas of cartilage that are weak. It's the soft tissue attachment, right, to the, to the these areas of cartilage that are very active and weak. So what do we see? We see injury. So it's a stress injury to the growing skeleton, to the apophysitis, right? So you all know Osgood Slaughter. We see the iliac um, apophysitis in the young Irish step dancer, right, that tight, contracted TFL. Um, how do they present? They present with the insidious onset, oftentimes, of localized pain, Sometimes we get x-rays, we may see widening of the, of the apophyses. Many times we don't. It's very straightforward, easy, most of the time easy clinical uh, diagnosis to make. And we treat them aggressively, right? We don't just rest them. We relatively rest them. So we keep them active. We send them to therapy. Our job from the medical side is to treat their pain, right? So if we don't effectively treat their pain, you guys can't effectively do your job. Right? So we try to treat their pain, we relatively rest them, and then of course our backbone, the physical therapy team, the athletic training team. So it's important when you talk about young growing dancers to talk about the triad, right? So this is a disorder of disease, right? And I think that optimally, of course, we would like our dancers to be here, right? We want them to have optimal bone health. We want them to have good nutrition, take in adequate calories, have normal menstruals. But unfortunately, a large number of our dancers are somewhere in the middle, right? So this is a subclinical disorder. It's a very large spectrum. And the onus is on us as healthcare professionals to ask these questions early. So you're in the clinic. You have a young, injured dancer in front of you. Pick three big gun screening questions and ask the questions early. Why? Because it's important, right? So 90% of women's peak bone mass is accrued by age 18 to 20. So if we aren't asking the questions early and we detect these disorders when the, at, when the dancer is 18, 19, 20, we've missed the boat, right, in large part for bone uh, mineral density or bone mass accrual. So ask the questions early and then, and then effectively act on that. So I use my nutritionist a lot. I refer to Kate Ackerman probably too much, right? So we refer. We use our nutritionist. We use, so ask the questions and detect these things early. So this is a, a good study, right? So we know the benefits of dance, right? So nor dancers with normal periods have been shown to actually have a better bone mineral density than non-exercising non-dancers with normal periods. But importantly, the take-home message here is that those benefits are lost with menstrual irregularities. So again, ask the questions early and act accordingly. So what's the takeaway message? So I think we all, physicians, healthcare provider, providers, physical therapists, et cetera, parents, teachers, dancers, they need to be aware of the unique physiological, psychological, nutritional considerations during this vulnerable time of growth in the discipline of dance. They need to modify their training and prevent and institute prevention um, strategies early while they can really make a difference. That's it. Tough act to follow. Um, a question we often get asked in our clinic is, when can I dance on point? So we thought it might be a useful topic to discuss so we know when we can advise the ballerina princesses of the future, when they can really put those point shoes on for real. Ballet is, uh, has a steep history and dates back to about the 16th century, but it wasn't until the 1820s until Marie Taglioni was the first dancer to perform on point at the Paris Opera Ballet. In today's world, the dancer, especially in the classical ballet dancer, point work is pretty much a requirement. And ballet tradition has dictated that age, years of dance, and ankle range of motion have been the, the factors that they look at to determine when a dancer is ready. But age of 12 years was the typical number that's tossed around, as well as years of dance, three to four years. 
And if we think about what we've just heard about what happens at the age of 12, they've just finished a growth spurt or just starting a growth spurt, all of those changes and issues that might develop, as well as uh, what Ruth has pointed out beautifully about the technique classes and the types of dance classes, I'm not sure the numbers alone tell the whole story. So I think we have to look at other aspects of the dancer and what the dancer's training is. One thing is their injuries. What injuries have they had in the past and what injuries might they have now that could affect their ability to properly train for point work? And have those injuries been properly and adequately rehabilitated and corrected? Of course, as Ruth pointed out, the alignment of the pelvis and spine. If you're going to stand on, on point, you better be aligned in your pelvis. Core stability, I use that term, but I don't think of it as the core of the apple. I think of it as the trunk, as the entire core stability. So for me, it has a different meaning. But I think that just points out that everybody's def definition or how they perceive core is very different. So I think we have to be very specific. Absolutely, those abdominals and the lower abdominal muscles are going to be essential. And then we look at lower extremity strength and neuromuscular control. If you're going to go up to releve and you can't have a correct foot position because you're not strong enough or you don't have that proprioceptive ability to hold that position, it's certainly not going to get any better in full point. So I think it's important to look at the dancer, either you in the office or someone in the um, dance studio, to assess whether they turn the feet in, wing the feet out uh, in releve before you can put them up on point. And this is illustrated in the picture there. <laughs> So I think it's pretty clear that dancing on point is a pretty specific and unique skill uh, to classical ballet. And it's not hard to imagine that issues related to alignment and placement, lower extremity strength and neuromuscular control, certainly in injuries, can affect that ability. And the dance medicine and science community more recently has started to look at this and investigate it uh, in a more scientific fashion. In 2004, uh, Mech and colleagues looked at components of a pre-point evaluation in dance schools across the United States. <clears throat> they identified in 75% of the institutions, they used the components of age, years of dance experience, present and past injuries, releve, alignment, and stability, tendu foot position, which is an assessment of that ankle range of motion, pointed, and the upper body stability and alignment. In 2010, Megan Richardson and colleagues at Harkness in New York looked at some functional tests that specifically evaluated trunk control and dynamic lower extremity alignment and placement to correlate with the teacher evaluations. And they found three specific tests that they've termed the airplane test, the topple test, and the sauté test. So there are ways to look at these things more functionally to make it more appropriate for each dancer determination. At the McKaylee Center, part of our goal is uh, to prevent injuries in the performing arts athlete and specifically dancers, of course. We have developed a protocol with the help of many uh, for a dance-specific assessment that goal is to identify any deficits that could predispose the dancer to injury and then to develop an individualized treatment program to correct those to hopefully allow them to dance more successfully and safely. Part of the dance assessment includes an assessment of posture, their alignment, uh, bite and scale for hypermobility, their range of motion, both uh, joint uh, range of motion measured as well as flexibility. Also strength of those abdominals, glutes, hip uh, muscles, which are all part of that core, uh, foot and ankle as well, and then some balance and functional movement assessments. Uh, uh, and we have the computerized balance assessment as well. And you'd be surprised how many dancers don't have the greatest balance. And that first and passe position, as Ruth pointed out, are very important. So if we try to wrap this up in a, a, a package uh, in, in some way, at least as a global way of thinking, of approach towards injury prevention in dancers, I think we have to look at the physical parameters as we've discussed in terms of where they are in their growth phase, what's happening with them during that growth phase, as Ruth has uh, ex uh, elicited the technique uh, differences that can occur. And what are they doing with their training? What's the dance class like? How many dance classes are they taking? Are they in competition programs where they're not really doing technique class? Or you know, is there a way to modify that? And then I think sort of the out-of-the-box thinking from the dance tradition is cross-training. Cardiovascular training, suspension training, pool bar or hydrotherapy, gyrotonics. I think we can and need to be creative in order to meet the demands of the movement patterns of the dancer, and particularly the classical ballet dancer. 
I think we, I don't know if we have any time for questions, but we thank you all very much for your attention. Um, training begins in the dance class, and that's where injury prevention begins. Unfortunately, most of you, have any of you taught dance, art teachers? One, two, that's it. Okay. Um, that's been my job uh, uh, for many years. And I feel a responsibility. These charming little girls, this is a picture from Europe in 1935, um, are trying to please their teacher no matter what their knees and feet allow, they're trying for the 180 degree turnout. <coughs> okay, technique class should be the first stop in injury prevention. Okay, teachers unfortunately teach what they have been taught for years and years. So that's just replicated through the dance class and through years of training. So what are some of the discrepancies? All of the slides that you'll see um, that I put up are wrong, what not to do. So they're not images of what is correct, okay? And most of uh, the work is done at a bar in, in ballet class, so you're holding on to something. And then you have to dance, which means <laughs> moving away from the bar. I've never seen a piece <laughs> except one of the old balance piece where the bar is actually on stage. So you have to learn to stand on your own. And the nice thing about modern class, even though Dr. McKaylee, this is modern a lot, <laughs> um, uh, uh, is we really don't use the bar. Okay, and um, we try to start emotional flow away from the bar. And uh, you're always, there's been enough talk about balance and the demand for balance. We don't want to use support systems. We want to be able to stand on our legs. Okay, and there is a discrepancy between what is being taught in class and what a particular dancer can actually do. And, you know, you have to look at the little girl or the person in front of you and say, what will that body accomplish? Can I make demands on that body that may be unrealistic? Okay, the more we know about what is being done in the classroom, uh, I know many of you know first and second and third and all of that and the little kind of gizzy things I, I demonstrated. But what really goes on in a dance class? Do you know what really goes on? When a dancer, they're fine when they're standing at the bottom, but when they're moving through space, what happens to this knee when they land? Uh, that's what it would be good to look at, even in your clinic. Just look <coughs> and know what we do in a dance class. Turnout, which is the big demand and one of the misconceptions of uh, dance, which is demanded and demanded of uh, ballet dancers especially, 180 degrees. 60% can be gotten from the hip, but the other 20, 30% is gotten from the knee and torquing the uh, ankle and foot. You can get an extra 15 degrees right down in the ankle without ever moving the hip socket, okay? It's, um, <laughs> you, you can think about what, if you do that every day, uh, what that does. And if you're at a bar and you're using the bar, this is very possible, okay? If I try to stand up with this, I, it's almost impossible. So, uh, now, oh, um, Go back one, just for a second. Uh, I want to uh, ask that you please look at your dancers from the side, no matter what. You look at them first and everything looks all right. You look at them in the middle of it looks all right. But once you look from the side and then you see this dancer, she looked pretty good from the front. But you see that she's anteriorly tilting her pelvis, and if you actually look at the leg when you're, when you're here and you do that anterior tilt, 
you get an internal rotation of the femur rather than an external rotation. And that is not what the dancer is really after. So if you just tell them, if you're turned out in the place that your, your femur goes, it doesn't go here. And that's why you ask them to do passe when you're in clinic. Do a passe for me. They're fine at first, then they take this first, which has maybe this amount of turnout, and then they do a passe and they go like that. <coughs> okay? And that anteriorly tilts the pelvis. This young lady can really get her leg up, but look what happens to her ribcage. Look what happens to the knee and foot and the hip. So height is not about <laughs> is not what it's all about. Stick it in your ear is not what we're asking. Snapping hip. How many people have ever uh, well, let, let me do what the first one I said. When I've ever asked how many in a group of dancers, dance teachers, how many of you uh, have had a snapping hip? 90% will raise their hand. Okay, it is not all right. This can be fixed. If you prevent the snapping hip syndrome, you will have saved the dancer from a lot of injury. So you really have to deal with it. Get, get a technique in your, and I can go through that uh, if, if we have more time, of how to avoid snapping that hip <coughs> on uh, a rond de jambe or a developer or anything as the leg goes around. And you hear crunch, snap, crackle. It's just not acceptable. Okay. Here you can see a posterior tilt in the pelvis. And as you see that posterior tilt, you see once the pelvis is tilted posteriorly, that you can't even straighten your standing leg. So if that pelvis is not aligned, you, one, once you posteriorly tilt, this standing leg cannot straighten. There's just no way to get it straight. Next. Okay. Um, this is pelvic strengthening. We're after strengthening and stretching the psoas, the pelvic muscles. I don't like to use the word core. Um, I, I know we're going to use it in a minute, but um, I'll make sure I clarify. It's all right. Um, because imagery to a dancer, she needs or he needs emotional images, and the core is like, if you think, oh, it's core. Okay, it's an apple, and the core is in the middle, but that's not where I want the dancer to work. I want the dancer to work in the deep psoas, which comes back against the front of the spine, which is much deeper and diagonal movement. It's not like a straight core of an apple, or sometimes core strengthening as it's used means you strengthen all of the abdominal muscles, peripheral abdominals, and then you have something like a tomato can, you know, with the outside. <laughs> really, uh, everything inside is sloshing around. Okay. Okay, let's go through the stretching. Uh, an intelligently designed stretching program. These are some dancers I taught in Beijing, and um, this was about 9 in the morning. They hadn't woken up yet. And then they are stretching everything out on the floor. Uh, this doesn't make any sense. You can't stretch until you warm up, okay? Um, and why we continually insist that everybody does splits in, in um, competition is beyond me. And I just want to mention, when the dancer comes into your clinic and the mother says, oh, get my daughter. Great, she has competition on Saturday, and she has this, this, or this. And when they mention the word competition, you know that they're not in a technique class. What they're doing is rehearsing routines that they are going to show over and over again, and they're just doing that routine. They are not being trained as a dancer, no matter what the mother says. So have your ears open as to what the training really is. 
in the dancer that you see, okay? And if you've ever seen one of those dance competitions, you'll know what I'm talking about. Okay. Um, this, this is the actual <laughs> title of that piece. Uh, I once saw it. I couldn't believe my eyes. <laughs> and, and thank you. <laughs> 